Hello, Birgit. Hello, Kolya, in Moscow. Yeah. Hello, hello from Moscow. And our conversation is about religious political dissent and libertarians, marginal libertarians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of, uh, about some connections between these uh, two, two phenomena of religious dissent, of sectarianism, of uh, different um, religious movement, both old and new one, and of their connectedness with some um, search for political alternatives, right? Right. Of political rebellion, rather. And we're also looking at specifics, uh, specifics in Russia, which can be maybe correlated to uh, a Baltic, to activities in the Baltic in the late and post-Soviet period, right? This is this is the topic we want to focus on. Yeah, uh, it, it's somehow correlated, of course, because we had a common Soviet space yeah. at one moment, and then process of uh, destruction, of demolition of this space was uh, similar in a way, more or less. Well, we, you came up with very interesting concrete cases that uh, you have examples from Russia and maybe you, um, yeah, you can, you can explain or describe some of these examples and then we can talk about what, I can, we can try to talk about what, what background, yeah, what yeah. historical background and context can be uh, activated to understand and explain some of these current uh, topical cases of political, religious political dissent. Yeah, sure. I can um, talk a little about how it appeared first for me. And yeah, I uh, began with three cases, three contemporary cases. So it was the beginning. And one of them is uh, Shaman Gabeshe, who uh, made who marched to Kremlin to exorcise demon demon from uh, Kremlin. Uh, it was a media story, so it's uh, quite well known. The other one uh, was um, a story of Albert Reisen, scientist and shaman as well. Uh, an activist of religious ethnic revival in Udmurtia, inside Russia. And he committed self-immolation some years ago. And the third case uh, was Anatoly Maskvin, a kind of gnostic libertarian. Um, quite a creepy story uh, he used to make uh, dolls, magical dolls with mummified remnants of young girls uh, who he engraved and made these dolls. And mm, so these three cases, I put them on different um, edges of the political scale. Uh, I think we can talk here about the left uh, part and right part. And mm, um, so, and um, the point is, uh, the whole story of uh, these three cases, it's not only about contemporaneity, it's about the much more longer historical, um, much more longer history, much more longer historical tradition of, connect, of connection between religious dissent and uh, marginal religious movements and uh, political search for political alternatives and political dissent. Yeah, and in, I mean, at least in Russia, we have this tradition. And I think you know it um, maybe better, better than me about all these things about uh, the boy area, double belief. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you mentioned uh, Gabishev as shaman. And you also said Albert Razin called him a shaman. So shamans are people who come not from European Russia, but they were came from a part of Russian 
empire, later Soviet empire, and they were people from ethnic groups, also from other religious groups, although shamanism has, has not always been declared a, a religion, but it points at a long tradition in Russian um, orthodoxy, Christian orthodoxy, uh, as the main religious institution and religion in Russia always had to uh, incorporate different non-Christian, pre-Christian belief systems, I would say. And this is called Dvayevirya double belief. Uh, for one thing, Russia was always a peasant country, but also Russia, the Russian Empire, had lots of ethnic groups that were not Orthodox or were forced into or baptized or forcibly or not uh, during the colonization, I would say, uh, of the East, Siberia and others. So the Dvayevirya, I would say, is once one, uh, one tradition that Orthodoxy had to incorporate. If we think of banyas uh, 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 that, that had to, uh, where banyas were in pre-Christian time for peasants, the um, chapels were built. So uh, the Orthodox people had to respect also the holidays, uh, pagan holidays, and anyway, incorporate this. That was one tradition of Dvayavire. I mention, only here mention a second tradition that was also a marginal one, but incorporated in part into orthodoxy, and that is individual mystical quests by people. So paganism and individual mystical quests, we could say also a certain type of mysticism, uh, had to be incorporated in, in orthodoxy. So we can always we, we, we can say that uh, tolerance and tension. This is quoting a religious uh, a historian of religious of religion, Maria Carlson. Tension and tolerance had always been part of Russian Orthodoxy. Yeah, yeah, and and um, I I suppose that it is connected um, uh, with the, some critique of uh, Dvoyeveria. We also mentioned with you in previous talk that. Uh, some, that it's now more, maybe even more common than before that um, scholars begin to doubt, um, not to doubt, but to say that it was not specific Russian uh, feature to to integrate some paganism, for example, as it was with Boeveria, uh, to integrate some paganism inside the um, Orthodox in Christianity in the mainstream religion. That it was yeah. much more this um, distributed much more common in the world, not, on, not yeah. only the Russian features, and that um, and that uh, it was a kind of academic myth that was created in uh, mostly uh, by Soviet scholars because they needed to find something in the past yeah. in popular beliefs and popular folk yeah. culture, which uh, led led uh, Russia to the revolution. Well, as far as I know, uh, when it's called a, a pop, uh, academic myth, as far as I know, the Dvayevirya was much written about by scholars of the Moscow Tartu school uh, of cultural semiotics. I wouldn't call them Soviet scholars, but scholars of the Soviet time. And I agree with you that if we think about Ireland or Scotland, this double belief systems were very widespread also in other countries of Europe. And, and it's a good point to say that it is not particularly a Russian specific. If we stare at Russia as scholars, we, we tend to, to say this is only Russia and this is what you, but yeah, this is one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but um, I mean, for me, it works. I would not uh, dismantle the whole concept of Vyavaria, but, but to dismantle maybe the specificity of, uh, the, yeah. yeah, the claim of the specificity of uh, only Russian specificity. Right, right. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, and um, this is um, one point for sure. This um, this uh, quite a rich tradition of um, some pagan and mystical, um, as you uh, mentioned, mystical uh, mystical tradition. Mm -hmm. Here we also can recall Isichasm, maybe. Isichasm, yes. Yes, well, definitely. And in the Soviet time, it's the name worship, Imya Slavit. 
So Hizihazm is the ascetic monastic tradition that, for instance, led to the Jesus prayer, which was uh, persecuted in 1913, as we know from the Mount Athos, the monks who uh, practiced the Jesus prayer uh, were uh, were arrested and taken taken off by you know by order of the of the Tsar and the Church. This was all displayed very good for the contemporary Russian present in the film Ostrov in the film Pavilungin's film The Island from 2006. Yeah. That's how most people in Russia maybe learned about this in in the post atheist present. Yeah, that's a super interesting topic. I mean, I read a um, book uh, written by Kiprian Karam. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Orthodox Church who migrated from Soviet Union to, mm -hmm. to Europe and he wrote that the mystical tradition was kept inside uh, Orthodoxy, inside the mainstream Orthodoxy, but in Catholic Church is, it became outside. The mystical tradition uh, existed not inside the mainstream Catholic Church, but inside a kind of alchemist or, myst or mystics Mm -hmm. uh some some not um not mainstream mystics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it, it was his um his version of uh of uh, distinction maybe between eastern church and western church that uh, that uh, in general eastern church orthodoxy um, kept mystic tradition um in uh, as isihazm in particularly inside yeah. um it's a very complicated topic, especially when it comes to political um, a political aspect. We'll talk about it later. But but you mentioned something: the image of Russia from the outside. I can uh, I can confirm this. Uh, in 2011, I was invited to the Esselen Institute, which is sort of the center of Western human potential movement in California, Big Sur also new age we can say and they wanted me to tell about russia because i wrote about new age in russia and the first question these founders of esselin asked me so what they know and what they're curious about russia for them always is connected with mysticism much more mysticism in the west yeah. and what also coincides to this image from the outside is the self-perception i think the a, 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 a strong self-perception of Russia is uh, that Russia, that mysticism is national also, is <laughs> sort of is something Russian national, and there it becomes uh, yeah there there it becomes you know connected with like the Russian soul and Russian orthodoxy being something national specific. This is a national myth, part of the national myth of Russia. So. Well, well, so we can so get into yeah. yeah. mysticism yeah. and political. So, yeah. Here we are in the realm of stereotypes, maybe already, but it, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. has some grain for sure. Right. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that's uh, the one point, maybe the most, uh, uh -huh. most popular, maybe. And the other one, which I, uh, which and, which I um, found during the, for myself during this investigation into religious libertarian topic uh, that um, Russian revolutionaries try to make connection uh, with religious dissent. So uh, the first case was maybe one of the first, let's say, it was by Herzen Ogarev and Bakunin. Uh, they published a supplement to the Bell newspaper in London in 1860s. Uh, wholly dedicated to all believers. So it was also the time of the emergence of Narodniks movement, of populists movement inside Russia. So it was the period before Marxists emerged in Russia. Um, and it was a time of uh, belief that um, folk, that, that common people or usual people, whatever it can mean, can be the fourth motor of revolution in anti-Tsarist struggle. So we are the first generation of uh, these revolutionaries. And then uh, mm, they dis revolutionaries disappointed with, uh, uh, with Narodniks. Narodniks, um, uh, yes, it was a failure in a kind. And then uh, the avant-garde of revolutionary for, uh, struggle um, shifted to Marxist 
and to uh, and they already made a bet on uh, proletariat. But uh, since maybe a uh, 1880s, uh, but uh, the interest towards um, a religious marginal movements uh, was held, uh, uh, cons uh, still still existed inside Marxist circles. For example, um, and uh, yeah, and in inside Social Democratic Party, Vladimir Bonch Bruyevich curated uh, this um, this uh, this direction. And uh, social uh, Russian Social Democratic Party even published a special newspaper, Dawn, uh, uh, as as I remember, in uh, 1903. They issued something around eight or uh, nine issues, and it wholly it um, mm, uh, uh, um, was aimed to uh, to to. To conduct social democratic work amongst radical sectarian circles, not already amongst all believers, mm. amongst um, but but amongst radical sectarianism mm. like uh, Skopje or Hlists or, or all this. But it's also but uh, they also uh, kind of cancelled this activity very fast. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 I mean um, uh, I mean I mean. Um, Mm, in in certain milieu, uh, even amongst Bolshevik party, uh, the interest towards uh, radical religion still existed even after revolution. For example, Gorky and Lunacharsky and Bogdanov, they, they in the first decade they, of the twentieth century, they uh, tried to implement the project of God constructing and so on. But I think a uh, kind of a peak of the interest of the real serious interest I mean, of the whole party towards uh, 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 sectarianism was in this down issue newspaper in the mm -hmm. very beginning of the um, 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you mentioned uh, uh, interest in sects and sectarian marginal religious dissent already in the mid 60s of the 19th century. Tolstoy was very interested himself a heretic, a radical pacifist who corresponded with Mahatma Gandhi against the uh, capital punishment, and he was excommunicated from the church. So he was also, in his own way, a re rebellious person. But I think uh, the interest in the sects had to do with a certain, as far as I know, a certain fundamental radical religiosity in these sects, in all of them. Uh, uh, Alexander Etkin, dis well, they were opposing all of them in their diversity, very diverse sects in Russia, but they all opposed the hierarchy of um, yeah. church. They were egalitarian in their structure, not in the gender, <laughs> very male dominated, but in the in the egalitarian idea of, um, um, and it also had to do with their belief because the sects rejected the a certain type of transcendence they were all millenarian millenarianists or you say millenarian millenarianists yeah. in their chiliastic belief that uh, the heavenly kingdom can basically be realized in within the life of people on earth they were very fundamental, very radical, and I would say far from being libertarian, we can talk about the term in terms of progressiveness, but the radical uh, opposition to secular structures like ecclesiastical structures, the dominance of the Russian Orthodox Church, I think that was something that made them interesting to the political anarchists and Marxists and the uh, you know, revolutionaries. I think that is a connection. The um, Alexander Etkin, who wrote about the Hlüste, uh, he yeah. makes the distinction between uh, three levels of the sects. One is the political, the uh, the relations to the society and government, which where they rejected hierarchy. The second is the um, um, mysticism. So rejecting the dogma, the, ch the church dogma, and having their own belief, their own theology. 
And the third is erotic, the relation to the body. And here we have the Skopti who were most radical and castrated themselves, even women. So uh, this is a certain radicalism, which uh, is, is maybe not compatible with the revolutionary concept of Marxist-Leninism. Yeah. Not, not, not all sides of their beliefs uh, were appealing <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for Marxists, for sure. Yeah. We see already how contradictory all this is. You know, it, 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 it shows already that we have some parts within the Orthodox Church, mystic, some mystic traditions, marginalized sects, and then outside of, of the church and also outside of government, but, but very, um, yeah, very contradictory, very complex, I think, is the whole situation when it comes to the political implications. Yeah, yeah, and I, mm, uh, you know, in my mm, uh, in my investigation of this, I tried to handle somehow this um, this contradiction contradictions mm. and try to settle, try to to pro, pro to make a projections of um, different mm, of different religious libertarians on on the uh, say traditional political scale. Mm -hmm. from left to right so and <laughs> yeah and yeah. in some cases it's uh, more possible in some it's very mm -hmm. uh, difficult to make mm -hmm. for example um, I can say that uh, amongst those three cases I mentioned the Shaman Gabashev may be the left libertarian left, uh, left libertarian because mm -hmm. he um, he's for uh, justice for equality for he wants to bring liberation to the whole people in, in Russia to the whole ethnicities no matter uh, of their difference and the right poll maybe uh, amongst them uh, these three cases it's more screen for me because it's for me it's very um, uh, individual uh, very a kind of gnostic luciferianism I, I tried to analyze his case, and it's, uh, for me it was incredibly difficult to, to make yeah. it. Uh, uh, I paid maybe some attention, especially to him, because it's uh, quite contradictory, very syncretic beliefs, because he was a paganism, he began as Celtic, uh, then um, he, he, he was a Luciferianist, uh, and he, for, from one side, he made these magical dolls as shaman usually do, as paganists, as traditional paganists do. And from the other uh, hand, he um, he demonstrated uh, direct Luciferian Luciferian uh, views uh, in a, in a kind of gnostic 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 Luciferian, it's not digital digital. Um, so mm, it, and yeah and. Mm, and in, in this sense, uh, for me, he's a kind of right-wing <laughs> um, libertarian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kolya, I would be cautious and I try to avoid the um, dichotomy of left and right applied to political. Uh, very basic, it might make sense, but there I would rather s stick to the word libertarian and we want to use it as we agreed before, not in the sense that it has been turned around and twisted, especially now in both America and Russia to something like uh, anarcho-capitalism. No, we use the word libertarian in the classical sense of progressive emancipatory project. Okay, if we can agree on that. And in this sense, um, if I should comment on Gabyshev and then Maskvin, as you said, I would say that Gabyshev really follows a, a concept which is, it's not only for Russia. He doesn't only want to liberate Russia. He, he has a universalist claim. He wants to liberate the, the world, actually, sort of. So it is open. And he, he's also funny. And to this, uh, I think he connects... Uh, a tradition which is serious, which is spiritual as a shaman, but he also connects it with humor 
And that reminds me of the Yurod, Yurodstvo, another tradition which may be really specifically Russian, I don't know, within um, Orthodox religion, but also on the margins. And I see Gabishev as a bit of a Yurod who can say wisdom, who can say truth under the guise of craziness. So he may simulate uh, craziness while to me, Masquin, although I really don't consider him only as a madman who is, uh, as far as I know, forced now into psychiatric hospital and yeah. sedated and actually, uh, actually gradually killed. This is horrible politically. But I, what I read about him is that he has a very sophisticated system of references, which in, in, in themselves have a lot of motifs that come from marginalized, but interesting uh, also ethnic and other trad pagan traditions, pagan traditions, these dolls, these Celtic. If, if you know more about the Celtic tradition and their rituals, then you understand he didn't want to kill girls. He's not a serial murderer, but you know, sure. just this, he's that's a much more complicated and also some kind of sophisticated mix. But you mentioned syncretism. This certainly is syncretism under the conditions of some crazy, isolated existence, I would say, because this poor man didn't have a community or didn't want, maybe he is, certainly is a certain neurosis there. Um, but here we see a certain mix, which is extreme, but maybe also has some symptoms of late, late and post-Soviet um, new religiosity or spiritual beliefs. Let's yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, all these cases, Moskvin especially, has um, some very personal features, very, very specific for himself. Like, for example, he wanted to uh, to make uh, to have daughter, but he was not able to do this, and this is very a very personal specific feature, uh, which is very important. That's why only girls and so on. But if we only look at these cases as a very individual, very uh, separated from everything, it's not interesting for me at least. Uh, I see, for example. Uh, in the case of Moskvin, mm -hmm. since we, we are concentrated a little bit on it, mm -hmm. I see them, mm, the continuation in a way of the tradition of occult underground, of Soviet occult underground. Because, you know, when I, I, I wrote uh, two separate texts on Moskvin and I read um, many of his newspaper articles. He, he wrote some uh, kind of academic work works and also a lot of newspaper articles and they are very critical to Soviet system these mm -hmm. articles mm -hmm. so um, for me he's for sure um, um, came from this late Soviet milieu of occult underground who was uh, a kind of dissident but not political dissident um, uh, but um, spiritual dissident to the um, Soviet regime, uh, and like I know, Yuzhinsky Circle as the most bright yeah. example, maybe. And he was not directly involved in Yuzhinsky because he yeah. lived in Nizhny Novgorod, and, uh, of course, and a little bit later. Uh, but um, I see it as in one direct lineage, is is one lineage, mm -hmm. and and what we have now with Moskvin as a huge social mm, bomb, a kind of media bomb. When, when it emerged, it was a media bomb. And when you begin to discover his case, it's very difficult because all you see, you know how our media works. You, you, you see these pictures of dolls, young girls. Wow, shit, it's something incredible. It's, it's like, a, I don't know, it's, a, you want to okay. stop. Uh, yeah, but, but then yeah. you begin to, to dig deeper and you begin to see that it's not just insanity it's not just uh, his personal weakness or his personal features it's something what exists with 
all of us, I mean, with all of um, Russia, that uh, with all Russians who, who live in a situation of post atheism, in, uh, mm. of, uh, of, uh, of uh, boom of new religious movements, but with all people all over the world, because we live in this, mm. uh, uh, how Charles Taylor called it as a supernova effect of the proliferations of this syncretism everywhere. Everything. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I would like to comment on a few of the things you mentioned. Uh, you began now that we, you know, uh, halt on Moskvin, but also Gabishev, and I want to bring in uh, Razin too. Uh, you said personal, personal motives. I would call it not only personal, but psychological. You say he wanted to have a daughter. So there is a tragic personal psychological effect. All these shaman, Gabishev, and uh, Moskvin experiment on the border of sanity and what is considered to be insanity, psychopathological borders. And what we have with the tradition of the sects, the radical dissent is always something on the margins. Society, as you say, the bomb in the media creates a horror story, a mass murder, a psycho, and identifies evil in this person. The person is sick. The person has to be locked away. Psychiatry, that is how it was in Soviet times, by far not only in Russia. <laughs> Let's remember. Uh, you know, the beat generation in Russia had this, uh, in America had the same in the 50s, and we can name lots of psychiatric cases in the 60s in the West, but um, not, to, not to distract. So experimenting with this, uh, with the realm of um, extreme deviance, let's call it deviance, you know, moral deviance, also psychological deviance. And here we have the connection with uh, Yuzhinsky Periulok. The son of a psychiatrist, Yuri Mamlev, the writer Yuri Mamlev, con connected in a tiny little one-room apartment in the 60s up to 50 people of all kinds of different descent. There was, uh, you, uh, in, in the first time, it was, it was writers, it was people who followed, who joined uh, uh, Mamlev in his aesthetics of monstrosity, let's call it. They wanted to experiment in aesthetic texts. But then also, this is controversial, but also in, in real life with the fact that only extreme experiences are needed to transcend the mediocrity of, mediocrity of everyday life. This is what Mamliev was convinced of. That's why uh, they wrote literary texts first. He wrote texts, you know, Chateauneuf, what is it called? The Sky Above Hell, his famous novel. Novel was Chiffres, and uh, they were called sexual mystics. And that again, later in the 90s, created this myth of crazy, a myth or reality, and they mythologized it themselves. But there were people in this, and there you're right, who read occult, esoteric texts, literature from the West. They were explicitly anti Soviet but understood themselves as explicitly unpolitical, but delved into the occult, and especially the uh, uh, esoteric Nazism and metaphysical, occult, political occult. Uh, uh, for instance, the theories about the conservative revolution, Julius Evola, and yeah. really, well, fascist, esoteric writing. Mamliev introduced or others introduced uh, René Guénon and traditionalism. <coughs> Excuse me. And that became um, part of this Eugensky circle. By the way, Eugensky had several times. So there was uh, Yevgeny Galavin, there was Gaydal Jamal, later there was Alexander Dugin, but even Viktor Pilevin uh, joined as a young man. So Eugensky doesn't stand only for one, but definitely for occult underground. And I think we can find many of these traits of the uh, radical, spiritual, 
Eastern, Western, politically occult, including Nazi and uh, fascist um, esotericism in the late uh, Soviet underground, for which Yuzhinsky is only one example. Yeah. <coughs> and, you know, here I want to touch maybe a little the, uh, the topic uh, of the term libertarian. You did it already. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And we discussed it. Uh, why we use it, and so I, mm, I had a, mm, some um, doubts and trouble with it when I mm, use it, uh, but I didn't find a better term. I mean, uh, and in in Russia we have two different words for this: libertarians and libertari. And libertarians, it's um, it's more connected with the with the concrete libertarian force. I mean, uh, what, what we think about uh, talking about libertarianism, it's, uh, it's a concrete political party which exists already in, um, in situation which existed for some time and uh, which has a program, a concrete political program and so on. And we also have a political libertarian political party in Russia and so on. But the other term, libertari, uh, it's it's slightly different, but it uh, you understand only that it is connected somehow with the freedom, with some liberation, with some emancipation. But it has no such uh, strong connections with institutional framework like libertarianism or libertarianism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, but when you translate this term to English, for example, libertari, you have no word for this, yeah. for this small but important difference. Um, so it was the, um, it, 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 it was some difficulty for me and it, yeah. uh, and, and it still exists, yeah. <laughs> this yeah. difficulty with terms. And it, it's mm -hmm. also a difficulty about them, um, the whole uh, libertarianism of nowadays, because as I see now it's incredibly, interesting uh, phenomenon, the libertarianism. It's a kind of, um, in the process of reassessment now, it's, it goes, it's, it loses its previous framework institutional and it goes somewhere where left and right poles merge, merge together. It's, um, I think it's, maybe now it's uh, um, the most interesting political force because it's, it's in, in very, uh, very interesting transformation or mutation. Yeah. So in this case, when I am thinking about libertarian, if we look at it through the lens, through the optics of, uh, of contemporary, of, uh, of this transformation, of this mutation of libertarianism, which we see everywhere with this neo-reactionary movement and so on, where the uh, place of reaction and um, acceleration, say uh, radical progress, it, change the places and uh, when I see this through these optics I think maybe mm, 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 it, 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 it's more maybe closer to that uh, mm, to that contradictory uh, and uh, very uh, compounded very mm -hmm. very multi-layered nature mm -hmm. of these uh, phenomenon religious libertarians which he wanted to exhibit uh, from the very beginning. I think what you talk about is, is much more than just a fight, uh, 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 an academic uh, dissection of words and terms, like let's argue about terms. It's very much about the uh, confusion of terms, of phenomena, and we need to specify always what exactly we have in mind when we use certain terms, because they do get confused and they also get instrumentalized. And when it comes to political implications, I think it is important to always uh, be aware how you translate this, not only into a different language, but also into a different value system, maybe. What attitude is expressed here, you know, when, when you say, uh, uh, when, we, when we deal with these phenomena, like somebody who is, Again, somehow, you know, uh, your three cases, 
uh, it is more than just libertarian is more than just left or right or yeah yeah uh, so I, I agree with you on this but I would like to uh, come back once more to that psychological aspect uh, Gabishev is also uh, like Yuzhinsky can be seen also as a psycho and from the psychoanalytical point of view uh, I think Gabishev is a case as is, is a, a case study from you who he wants to what is he, he goes to Moscow to exorcise uh, yeah, exactly. the you possession uh, uh, the demon from Putin this on the on the surface level again for the boulevard press is some kind of crazy thing some kind of crazy person and even you know can criminalize him arrest him but this exorcism may be associated to people regular people to exorcist rituals which are right now in the hundreds performed by priests of the orthodox church but this is not what Gabishev may have in mind if we if we think a little more and go to a different level we can see that he he doesn't want to kill he wants to purge and yes. the, and here is where the shaman the ritual of purging comes in maybe in a urotstva in a way of urotstva a ritual uh, which has once been taken very seriously but wh when we look at for instance Pavel Lungin's film uh, uh, the island Ostrov, where also some exorcism takes place this can be even seen as a therapy maybe a shock psychotherapy of society if you look at it as a metaphor a metaphor for purging a whole society not only uh, chasing a demon out of a political leader like the swine were, uh, were like the uh, the demons were chased out of the swine in Dostoevsky's novel Biese. you know this is a metaphor where where much of it comes from but also you can take it as a psycho psychoanalytical psychotherapeutic ritual of purging society from the trauma of Soviet past because a mass trauma is what I think uh, Russian society and many people think that many scholars or something try to, uh, to use this approach to to the state of the society after a trauma so I think it is many layered as you say it has many layers and that's why it's uh, it's an interesting case Gabishev yeah yeah and, and yeah it's it's super interesting the topic of exercise as well and I listening to you I I think that it's um, it's another language for talking about trauma. Yeah. Um, it's just another language, it's just another uh, point of view on it. And I adore Yakutian horror movies. And um, they're super, um, super rich in, in meanings. And um, I mean, it's a kind of low fi movies. And uh, the main genre, maybe it's horror, but it's not because they all crazy, you know. It's uh, it's not because they want to, uh, I don't know, they want to market niche for horror or something like this. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, for me, the point is that for traditionalist worldview, or let's say animist worldview, uh, like uh, like which is much more important for Yakutian, for example, than for Russian, uh, their political modernization uh, of 20th century, Soviet political modernization, was a process which gave birth to uh, many demons, to the many malicious spirits, bad spirits, because when you kill people, this spirit uh, haunts you. It's, it's not... Um, um, it's not just to kill people and forget and, and go somewhere else. This spirit will haunt you and will haunt your, your family and will haunt everyone who will come to this place. And um, uh, the common uh, plot in Yakutian horror movie is something about uh, that people, nowadays people, contemporary people, young people, 
came come to old village somewhere in the Yakutian Arctic, and it's abandoned, and it's full of spirits. And uh, at some point, the story of uh, of Soviet modernization, of collectivization, of shaman killing of, uh, appears. And we understand that it's closely connected together, that uh, uh, from the more traditionalist animist point of view, it, uh, this is a uh, not resolved question, that we just move to another era, not Soviet, for example. Uh, we, we should resolve this problem somehow because these spirits, they, malicious spirits, they are amongst us. Mm, and, mm, it, you know, in, 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 through these optics, it's not funny at all, this story with Gabashev. He's not insane, maybe we are insane, or I don't know. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I, uh, I, I, I agree with you that this topic of Yakutian, you say Yakutian horror movie, uh, is a extremely fascinating cultural phenomenon. It is Eastern, you say, uh, it has the aspects of all, it is concocted of all the, what do you say, supernova, Charles Taylor, everything at once. The, the, the pain of the colonized uh, pre-Soviet pre mixed then with Christianity, shamanism, and the and it's the land of the gulag, not to forget, because people were, you know, the Yakuts, the Siberia is where, where, the, where the prisoners were sent always. And all this together with uh, often finds an expression in genres of popular culture. I think, you know, a horror movie is a genre of popular culture, just like science fiction and fantasy are genres of popular culture in which deep, deeply rooted fears and traumas find a outlet somehow and find it, it's not it's not coincidental that this is the one of the main movie uh um, genres now but you know in general but the yakutian yeah. is special because these were in Arutze, these were ethnic minorities in the Russian Empire and then in the Soviet Empire. So shamanism and their religion was suppressed. The people were arrested, just like Russian Orthodox, other religions. But over there, that was their religion, was suppressed and people were killed for this. And now it comes up. And I would like to uh, bring in here a, an idea that... I think the Soviet atheism, the militant atheism, created unwillingly uh, conditions for the emergence of a new religious transformations or new religious beliefs because religion as such was suppressed whether this be orthodoxy or Buddhism in Mongolia, Buryatia, or shamanism in Siberia. And it was also, um, ethnicity was also mixed with national. With national. So yeah. ethnic groups uh, were uh, put in all the passports, was the ethnic, ethnicity was identified as national. I mean, let's say you were uh, in... Uh, Russian and Ukrainians had in their passport um, Russian, okay? And Russians identify themselves with orthodoxy. But but the Tatars and the Uzbek, uh, uh, they had uh, Musulmania. They were Muslims as their ethnicity. And then there was the ethnicity of Jews as a nationality, we know. And so uh, ethnic identity was a lot built on this ethnic minority, which was repressed and was colonized, but then uh, became identified, for instance, with a certain religion. And that adds to this. But I wanted to say uh, the religious revival was because you had to discover re religion. And that was since the 70s, actually, in the whole Soviet Union, people discovered religion, all religions at once and, and mixed, that makes to the mix. 
and they had to commit and it was not embedded in traditional family because it was not, not there. It was atheist society. So I think the revival of religion was some kind also a consequence of Soviet politics. It's one of the paradoxes. Yeah. And, and for them, it was a kind of emancipation yeah. when they found these roots and uh, yeah. to make distinction with other groups of people. Right. And here we have um, um, uh, a continuation of this um, theme with the demolition of Soviet uh, space of USSR and the different roots. Uh, a kind of, uh, it's not different roots, but I mean, uh, for example, Baltic states, they gained independence and Russia also gained independence. So yeah. <laughs> from your society and, but uh, for example, uh, Albert Rising, who was a um, Udmurtian shaman and who was a, one of the leaders of religious revival since 70s, 80s, and then very active in 90s with all religious revivals uh, worldwide and in also this space, but uh, it's a, for me, it's a, and if, if I can reduce it, uh, it's a kind of unsuccessful singing revolution. You know, his, his attempts um, towards the emancipation to the independence, to the cultural independence first of Udmurtian uh, culture and Udmurtian specific religion. It's a kind of um, unsuccessful singing revolution. Why unsuccessful? Uh, because a singing revolution ended in state independence in Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia and Udmurtia still in Russia. So, yeah, and uh, also in the case of Rising, we have uh, the, um, uh, uh, the malignant spirit because we can't understand his gesture of self, self immolation without the, his uh, worldview because he self-immolated himself uh, near the government, near the main government building. He, it's, uh, 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 it's um, according to traditionalist worldview and shamanist, shamanist worldview, it's uh, a kind of revenge. It's, the, it's uh, because you kill yourself and your spirit we, uh, 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 cannot uh, have rest and it, it will be haunting your your enemy, which which for Razin was the uh, was the government of Udmurtia. So it's uh, so he is not just a crazy person who self immolated himself everywhere. Uh, in, in, in yeah. So did he use this as some? I mean, it's tragic, and it's a tragically individual case of a martyr sacrificing himself, but. Did he use this or did he understand it, his act of self-immolation as a sp kind of spiritual weapon? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Oh, it, it's I called have... Tipshar, Tipshar, <laughs> specifically okay. called Tipshar in, in Udmurtia, Chuvashia, and in this um, uh, Volga, Middle yeah. Volga basin. And, and you said he's yeah. Udmurt, which is also the Nordic, Nordic ethnic minority. Uh, I would, in the, I would at this moment maybe bring in. This is one case of a tragic case of who points to the uh, undoubtedly repressive politics towards these minorities, their languages and cultures, which is going on right now, and not only in Russia. You know, the extinction of these uh, ethnic uh, minorities and languages. But there was another Nordic. Uh, person I would like to mention, which is the um, uh, Russian Komi mathematician, philosopher, uh, mystic anarchist, Vasily Nalimov, who has uh, roots also in Komi. His grandfather was a shaman and his father was an ethnographer, the, the founder of ethnoecology. But Nalimov himself became a mystical anarchist in the 20s. Uh, he lived until 97 and survived Kalema Gulag 18 years. He himself 
Well, he was part of a secret society. This is occult underground in Soviet times, secret society that prevailed in individuals and very prominently in Nalimov himself until the post-Soviet time. And this is, I would say, an example for a benevolent, let's say also uh, not malignant, but a universalist uh, Gnostic, Christian Gnostic, but open to Eastern too, uh, concept of life, which continues some of the traits in a in a, let's say, really libertarian way as we want to talk about it. Because pacifism, Gnosticism, um, the active social engagement, social justice, is the, the prominent trait of, of Nalimov's life and love, love thy neighbor, but also, you know, love of God, including sexual love, free, all this is part of a not only worldview but a lived existence which is to me connects many of these traits of people or, or traditions that we have now talked about but i would say most of these traditions sectarian traditions have turned or even many of the yuzhinsky late soviet occultist traditions have turned into either a nationalism. Razin is a local nationalist, I would say, ethnic local nationalism. And that's not necessarily a model. You know, others like Gabishev and Alimov are have universalist and still connect and embrace um, worldviews that are that are not, in your sense, right wing or nationalist or fundamentalist radical in a political sense. So here I see somebody who one could follow, identify, would be interested in, in interesting in, in a yeah, libertarian future. And that's the uh, that's the gay the the goal of the Riga Biennale, isn't it? <laughs> to to find examples yeah. for you know for me also was interesting when I visited Riga and uh, conducted some research on Baltic context that um, uh, if we are talking with, about Nalimov and Rising, they were Finno Ugric people. And uh, the religious revival among Finno Ugric people is very con close connected with Baltic context. Mm -hmm. They had in Estonia, they had ethno futurism manifesto in Tartu, around Tartu University in the beginning of the 90s, as I remember. It's um, super influential now in Finno Ugric world. Mm -hmm. And when you see the um, communities of Finno Ugric people in Russia, like Komi or um, Udmurtian or Mordovian or Meria, uh, yeah, they all use ethno futurism language and they all have these festivals. And it all began in Baltic context uh, because they were in vanguard. And the first festivals of this kind were held in the Baltic context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I also would uh, like to say a little about the difference maybe between the Baltic context and Russian in a way that uh, when I try to find uh, the cases of religious libertarians in Baltic mm -hmm. context, uh, I saw that they are not, uh, it's more difficult to find hot cases, you know, hot political cases like as Ryzen or Gabashev now in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm, I mean, uh, there are maybe more cases even in Baltic context because um, like uh, Div to Riba or Remova, it's, it's super interesting. And um, I think we should also say a little bit about Div to Riba and Baldis Towns, uh, which I'm really a fan of. <laughs> his way, his route uh, from the kinetist and high modernism mm -hmm. uh, artist uh, towards the twist of new religion of the mm -hmm. uh, But in general, I mean, um, these uh, new religious movement in Baltic context, they were very active and very emancipatory during the Singing Revolution. For example, Scandinavian Paul group, 
um, and Stalter family. They were one of the leaders of this revolution. And when you uh, uh, Google uh, the images of Syngan revolution, uh, you, you can easily find um, uh, photos where Skandinaiki uh, holds, holds their flag of um, Latvia. It, it was one of the first cases, as I know, as Lugis Stalter said to me, uh, that it was, it was one of the first cases when a uh, uh, Latvian flag uh, was raised uh, public, in, in public. And it, it was done by Skandinaviki, by, by this milieu who began to, uh, to investigate uh, into folk and ethnographic context uh, since 70s and then in 80s, and then they became very active in political. Um, in political way in late 80s, and they were one of the leaders of the Singen Revolution. And then now, when you see this, you see this incredible, uh, incredibly rich history of uh, of, co of of merging between uh, religion and folk uh, interests and revival and political emancipation in 90s during the Singen Revolution. And now you see that mostly it exists in cultural milieu, uh, like um, uh, Kaspar Vanex, when we talk about this, he said to me that, you know, uh, your cases um, are hot politically, but it's difficult to find it, uh, such cases now in, uh, in, in Latvia here, because it's, uh, we have more commercial, we can easily find like some yogin, many yogin schools, or some, many different uh, new religious movement, but uh, 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 often they act as uh, um, commercial structures, just, um, I mean, um, uh, they, they, it seems that they lose mostly this emancipatory um, accent, which they had once. And um, yeah, and, um, Mm, this is uh, really raised the question uh, mm -hmm. how these mm, movements <coughs> are contradictory. How what was the what what had the emancipatory aim once? How it easily switched to something other, or how it can switch easily again to emancipatory when something will happen? For example, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let me ask you something. I see, would you say that one of the specifics of the Baltic uh, movement is uh, 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 music? Yeah. Okay, I think so. And the other is, were they all pacifists? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't think so. For example, Div to Riba in 30s, they were not pacifists at oh, all. Okay. Okay. But, but now uh, after revival, they are more pacifists. Mm -hmm. But it, could it be possible that, um, this is just a question that arises, uh, the, the, the Russian cases are definitely more radical. And when you say cultural, uh, in the more, they have become cultural and you also say commercialized in the Baltic. Is it possible that this has to do with the less explicitly political character because there, um, there's not such a pressure of repression? because the political repression is authoritarian system in Russia, government is right now really, really urging. And some people get to the point where they oppose in such a radical way as individuals. Could that be one reason of the difference? Uh, yeah, I think that's the case. Yeah. I right. think yes, because, because if, if you have more freedom, more spiritual uh, religious freedom, yeah. It's not a problem. In the, the less you need to. <laughs> you can practice this. No, no. Right. And, uh, yeah, but from the other hand, not so much tension and not so, yeah. uh, not yeah. so hot cases. Right, right. What may be, if we, if we try to um, not summarize, but point out what may be the, the, the role in a libertarian perspective of these new religious movements, um, uh, connecting even the traditions of ethnic <clears throat> uh, animism, 
would you say i i would i would think that uh, the role of all this is uh, very individual self empowerment of people under the conditions of soviet repressive system and and of course a yearning for communities is there in the new religious movements they're not only single people but but em empowerment may be something against dogmas against um government hierarchies this might i'm asking is this maybe something that connects the with all the paradox and contradictory multi-layered tradition and lines of uh that might be one motif that goes through till today yeah yeah i mean for me the nature of all these movements no matter um masculine garbage or leave to riba uh, uh the most interest maybe that at some point uh they become a tool a uh, leader of some emancipation whether ethnic or national or individual liber libertarian or luciferianism uh, ecological radical Ecologic? sorry pardon ecological is that Eco a topic? No. Is exactly that yeah gabishev ha has right? this i think yeah. it's a big topic in the baltics the whole ecology yeah yeah Destruction, which is ongoing the permafrost you you did a project on it a very impressive project in yakutia thanks pointing in one one very impressive painful picture the the destruction of nature that they experience this is maybe the biggest one of all yeah it's it's very um very important for baltic context yeah uh the, and uh, here we can i think in in baltic context we can see the peaceful uh progressive animism in a way it's the um i feel maybe the most sim sympathy to such kind of movements mm -hmm. yeah the, just peacefully to how to live in peace with your environment mm -hmm. how how to how to do it how, how. and i think it's the knowledge uh, which can be useful for everyone mm -hmm. but no matter where you live um, yeah. Uh, yeah and mm, and and for me all the all the tendencies we discuss today they are still on the table they still yeah. uh, we still live uh, amongst this absolutely yeah. absolutely the violence you know the whole issue of violence incorporated violence where the cases you raise are all cases where where you know razin turns the violence against himself but in order to create a violent curse on others so it's a deeply traumatized situation of society in which everything is so extremely violent and and that's why it's probably it's really on the table and and what we try to raise here is the spiritual dimension of it and not to see it only as religion as traditional institutionalized religion but everything that's not outside but on the margins let's say on the margins inside and a lot also outside of the uh, institutionalized russian orthodox religion mm -hmm. i think th this has been our topic yeah and for me also uh stays very important uh, a kind of new language when you for example talk about the exorcism or we can talk about the healing or purging of society from malignant spirits yeah. it's just the other language about the common disease like you know the most circular contemporary artist can make a memorial to the right. i don't know holocaust victims he 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 do exactly the same uh, as uh, as uh, as this yakutian uh enemies do but just on other language yeah, yeah and i would add this um uh, mystical anarchism i like not only the word which is used in very different ways but also as a tradition as something to um to yeah to trace back and it's worth tracing back and then uh uh, revive it or or th that can be you know it's continuous a way of opposing in a spiritually it's it's actually it seems to be an antithesis anarchism 
in the minds of at least Western um, people is something political, yeah. purely political. Mysticism is something, oh my God. Some people say mysticism, in the popular parlance, mysticism is everything not understand. we don't understand, irrational. Something strange and crazy, spiritual, mystical. This is mystical to us. In Soviet times, mysticism was everything irrational. It was a it was a polemical word for everything that was considered not uh, outside of Marxist lineage. But with all this, if if we say if we think them together, I think this this is a explosive uh, spiritually or politically even explosive uh, phenomenon, which can connect in a new language. You talk about we need a new language to uh, express images or art and i think yeah, indeed i think we have the same connection maybe in religious libertarians because libertarians is something very secular it's not yeah. how it is connected with religious yeah. yeah and i also maybe want to uh, to add one one thought um continue continue on your and continue on your uh that uh i think that for maybe for some um, hundreds of years, or at least to uh, uh, last 200 years, we, uh, I mean, art and science uh, and humanities, we try to found something secular in complex phenomenon, like to found something secular in, like in uh, Munster Rebellion, how to find something emancipatory or totally secular in complex phenomenon. And I think maybe now it's time to find um, when we are talking about this new language, uh, to to look back to this complex phenomena, which uh, yeah. always were very complex, and yeah. try to find through them um, this um, back way of secularism and all this uh, 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 on their mystic side, but through uh, yeah. after 12th, 20th century. Yeah, yeah, and avoid clear classifications. Nalimov always said he's, it's fuzzy. The phenomena are fuzzy. They, they escape clear, not to mention stereotype, but clear dichotomous clarification. You say secular, non-secular, profane, religious. No, you say things are very complex and now we need to find a way to express this. And that can be metaphors, that can be words, but forms to express this. Yeah, I agree with you. Super. I think it's point to finish. Yeah. Maybe. We make an end, we and they couldn't, have to we couldn't find the better point. Good. <laughs>